Oh, what a great song. Thank you, Brother Malcolm, and thank you, ladies, for playing the instruments. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, please, to uh, um, uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And uh, my, this is uh, a portion of Scripture that is so appropriate to the time which we are living. We have been going through the book of Romans, and we dealt with the first three chapters in the book of Romans, and, and from those three chapters, we answered the question, is the all, whole world lost in sin? And then from chapters 5 all the way through uh, chapter uh, 8, we sought to answer the question, can God save all of the ungodly? And uh, we answered those questions by saying, yes, yes. And then we came to chapter 10, or 9, 10, and 11. And the question is, what is God going to do with Israel? Has he abandoned them forever? Or does he have a plan for them? Now we sought in chapter 9 to uh, talk about Israel's past. And uh, in we dealt with that. And in chapter, uh, chapter 10, we talked about Israel's present and showed from Romans chapter 10 that God will save the, both the Jew and the Gentile. And then we come to chapter 11 and the question is what is God going to do uh, in the future with Israel? And we answer that by saying there is a future restoration of the nation of Israel. About four or five Sundays ago, I shared with you the fact that many of the early commentators uh, and Bible scholars even would get to chapter 9 in the book of Romans and they would know, wouldn't know what to do with it. And so they would skip it and go from chapter 8, eight to <coughs> chapter 12. And maybe some of you here this morning might be thinking, well, why don't we skip chapters 10, uh, 9, 10, and 11 uh, because uh, uh, it doesn't answer the questions and the problems that I have in my Christian life. Well, you'll find out from this that it does answer every question that you may have and every problem that you may have. And I think it's a whole chapter teaches this. Frederick the Great was king of per Prussia. It was a territory which was we call modern day Germany and Poland and, and, uh, and Russia, as well as some other nearby nations. And he was greatly influenced by the French atheist Voltaire. Uh, we are told that he once asked his minister if they would offer him one single irrefutable proof of the existence of God. And this uh, minister replied by saying, there is your majesty, the Jews. Think for a moment and let that sink in your mind. The Jews are proof for the existence of God. That's a tremendous answer. Why? Just think about this. What a, what, is there one nation that has lasted for 4,000 years? Y'all know of any other nation in history that's lasted for 4,000 years? We know when the nation began, according to Bishop Usher's chronology, it started in 1920 B.C. Why and by whom? We have detailed written records of her ancient as well as modern history. Her language remains the same, Hebrew, and, and uh, as well as her religion and her, uh, uh, her traditions. Their homeland, if they can get it all, you know who the Gaza Strip belongs to? The land belongs, according to God, to, to who? Israel. To Israel. 
does. And boy, you can you go back to Genesis chapter 17, you'll find out that there is a, a whole lot more uh, room over there where that belongs to the Israelites. But the Israelites have never owned and controlled all the land. But according to the Bible, one day they will control every bit of that land when the Lord Jesus comes. And you know another thing about it, they continue their bloodline. One of my doctors is a Jew. You know what his last name is? Levy. Levy, L-E-V-Y. Good guy, boy, really good, nice guy. And really, really strong. Good, good doctor. I recommend him highly. You know, not only that, they still follow their original documents and their guidelines for their faith. They use the Torah, the first five books of Moses, of, of Moses and surely for a nation to exist for so many ministry, ministry, centuries, it must have been pampered and protected by the world. No, <laughs> right? No, 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 no. That is, however, what makes the survival of Israel even more marvelous and miraculous and divinely overshadowed is that no nation has been robbed and deported and murdered and hated as much as the nation of Israel. They spent 400 years in slavery. Is there any nation in the world that's spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt from 1846 to 1448 B.C.? How about the northern ten tribes being captured in 721 B.C.? And we haven't seen any of those uh, tribes since then, but they're somewhere. And now there was a man by the name of Herbert W. I call him all wrong, uh, Armstrong, that used to believe that we were part of the lost tribes. You and I are part of the lost tribes. And uh, I heard uh, Dr. Oliver Green said, you shouldn't be trying to find the lost tribes. You should be trying to find you, your lost neighbor and tell him how to be saved. That's what uh, the way Oliver Green answered it. The Babylonian destroyed Jerusalem, the capital, in 586 B.C. A remnant of Jews returned to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem about 496 B.C. And then uh, not only that, but nations scattered throughout Europe, Asia, and the entire world, uh, they have been for the last 1,800 years. The Holocaust killed millions of and these scattered Jews living in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in about 1940. The Zionist movement reestablished Israel as a nation in May of 1948. East Jerusalem was captured by the Israeli Defense Forces in, on June 7, 1967, during the Six-Day War. And then the United States officially recognized Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel, on January the 7th, 2017. And every day you hear reports about what nation? Israel. Little Israel. Even without the modern developments of our time, Frederick the Great had to agree that the Jews are the miraculous proof of the existence of God. His reliability and the keeping of his word. Amen? Where are the Assyrians now? Where are the Amalekites now? Where are the Jebusites now? And where are all the termites now? I mean, uh, we, all, all of them are no longer in existence, are they? And uh, they, they were in a group called termites. I'm just kidding there. At first glance, like Romans chapter 11, that deals with the subject of whether God still has a plan and purpose for the Jews or not, uh, you seems maybe ir irrelevant to your life. And you say, well, how does the future of Israel have to anything to do with staying happy in my marriage? 
How does the f future of Israel have to do with the pressures that I have in my life right now and just paying the bills and just getting by? Or how does Israel's future have to do with rearing children and keeping them spiritually healthy in an evil world? How does Israel's future have to do with personal problems that I have and physical health? And, and how does Israel's future have to do with the problem of aging? I have a problem with aging, don't you? A real serious problem with aging, you know. Uh, my get up and go has got up and gone, it seemed like sometime. And, but I'm still around, and I look in the obituary column, and I find that more people are dying younger than me. And I think sometimes I'm getting so old, I'll be like Dr. Don Sis said, uh, my friends in heaven are up there wondering if I made it or not. But I am made it. I made it, and it's in his blood. Amen? Now, some people say, well, preacher, if your parents think of doing a series of sermons on Israel in 9, 10, and 11 on Sunday morning, maybe I ought to skip church till you get to chapter 12 because that doesn't have anything to do with me. I just told you that it has everything in the world to do with you. Why? But let me you know, just note several reasons why the subject should be of interest to you and me. And I just put them down quickly here, and there are a lot of others, but let me run through them. And, and if you have your notes there, you can take the notes and fill in the blank down. First of all, the underlying issue that Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 11 is, can God's promises fail? Now, that question is one that it doesn't make any difference what you're experiencing in your life. God makes promises, and he does keep his promises. Amen. It's all right? Just put that down. God chose the nation of Israel as his people apart from all the other nations of the earth according to what, what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. And through the, through the prophet Jeremiah, God assured that this sinful nation, that as they were about to go into captivity, that he promised to Israel that his promises would never fail Israel. And to dismiss the thought that Israel's sin could lead to a permanent rejection, God added in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 37, these words, listen to what it said, and you ought to unline this in your Bible. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I will not cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Boy, what a promise. Those Jews are going to be around. In other words, if God rejects Israel and his people, then his promises can fail. And in his promises to Israel can fail, how can we know for sure that his promises to you and me that's recorded over in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that call according to his promise. That is a promise from God. And then in the next few verses over there, in verses, I, I think, at uh, 30 through 35 of Romans chapter 8, he tells us there that, that he is going to love us forever and ever, that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And if God can break his promise to us with Israel, he can break that promise too. How can we depend on that? Well, can you trust God to do as he promises? That's the question. Secondly, on a broader scale, if you pay any attention to the news, you know, on doubt, feel at times that the world is out of control and that the bad guys are winning. You ever feel that way? My, oh my. <laughs> what you see is the hor horrors of terrorism, uh, war, and more and more natural disasters are wiping out thousands, and you hear 
about terrible crimes to the little children. You read about corruption in government, both in Washington as well as around the world. And you read about Christians being killed by Muslims in, in Muslim countries, and the list goes on and on. And sometimes it can get me, they become very depressing to us who are Christians. But if you look in Romans chapter 11, you'll see it shows us that God is in charge and that the promises of God and his purpose will not fail. Amen. And as we say in Lewis Letter, I guarantee that. I guarantee that. It's old uh, Uncle Buddy Robinson was an old tongue-tied preacher up in Kentucky. And boy, could he ever preach. <laughs> and he was he tongue-tied. He kind of talked like that. He said... I, I'm so faith in Jesus that I could swing over hell on a rotten corn stalk. Well, boy, that's wonderful to be safe in the Lord that way, isn't it? I like his analogy of that, don't you? Then I want you to notice third thing. This chapter shows us how we should view the Jewish people today. In viewing the Jewish people today, we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. However, it is also important to understand whom we're praying for. Therefore, we need to recognize that God and Israel have some key enemies and adversaries today of what they are doing to harm Israel and the Jewish people. Though some of the, these opponents are individuals, we'll just focus on just the governments and their movements quickly and let you know who they are. First, their first enemy, of course, is Hamas. And you might write that in your notes. The massacre of uh, October 7, 2023, was by far Hamas's bloodiest attack. Scores of Jews were killed, <coughs> as well as 17 Arabs, including a nine-month uh, pregnant lady. 33 U.S. citizens were killed and 250 hostages uh, were taken uh, from 20 nationalities and five different religions. Hamas imprisoned its captives in a, a network of tunnels that was built uh, to uh, take care of that and store their weapons as well. And some of the hostages were released and others were killed, but I checked on the 13th day of June when I was working on this sermon and uh, there are 120 remaining hostages, but a senior Hamas official has, has told CNN that no one has any idea how many of them are still living. And that any deal to release them must include guarantees of a permanent ceasefire and the complete withdrawal of Israel's troops from Gaza. Hamas goal. What is their goal? Uh, their goal, according to their own uh, constitution, states in the preamble these words. Israel will exist and will continue to exist until it is Islam will obliterate it just as it uh, liberated others before it. And it continues on by saying the day of judgment will come about, well, Will, will come about and not will come about will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind the rocks and the trees, and the rocks and the trees will cry out, "O oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him." Hamas blames the Sinus for global conflict, concluding there is no war going on anywhere without having their fingers in it. He said they they start wars. Based on what they believe in their charter, its leaders openly call for the complete extermination of the Jewish people and the dis demonic hatred organization led by, uh, is, is involved in slaughter of a, of, it's, it's absolutely unreal. I don't even think that some people would even uh, uh, do to animals what they're doing to their fellow human beings. Hamas uh, symbolize, has 
uh, people who, who are on their side all the way around the world, and they are absolutely uh, the worst type of people uh, on the face of the earth at this time. The group's own words, however, reveal hate and murder as its motivation. They even train their children to kill. That's uh, they're what they're brainwashing their children to kill Jews. Second link there is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a Shiite Muslim mil mil malicious group that came into being somewhere uh, around the, this uh, way, time about 19. 90 and has since become part of the Lebanese government and they are out to, out to uh, destroy Israel as well. Then of course there is Iran and the Iran covers much of the uh, Persian Empire and they are uh, certainly those that are interested. They do not believe that the Holocaust really happened and some still debate Iran's role, uh, Iran's role in the October 7 massacre because the nation has backed and funded Hamas uh, constantly. And then, fourthly, there is the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority came up as a, as a local administrative body of the Palestinians' liberation organization in 1994, and they are still against uh, the, the, uh, the Israel. And first, fifthly, and here's one we want to really spend some time talking about uh, this morning, is there, is, there are Western anti-Semitics. And with this, we have two divisions. First, there is complaints of anti-Semiticism in politics. In the past five years, and especially since October 7th, anti-Semiticism has grown more uh, vicious and unlike any since 1930. It continues to take many forms uh, in the West arising both to the far right to the far left. There's the far right who consider themselves, call themselves Nazis who are against Israel and uh, they very strongly against uh, Israel. And then secondly, there are those that, uh, that arises in the context of sympathy for Islamic extremism for the Palestinian cause. They're just, they, they're just on the, the Palestinian side of the fence. And these recent surges in anti Semitic incidents proves how quickly hatred of Israel boils over into hatred for the Jewish people. Globally, it has grown increasingly acceptable not only to place the full blame on Israel for Israel's Palestinian conflict, but also to present the Jewish community as a powerful force in the world. And this, these lies have consequences with threats and intimidation and violence through individual Jews and will continue to be more serious if uh, present trends remain unchecked. And the, uh, the universities and colleges across the country, and you know this, and I don't have to remind you, they are, many of them are very, very anti-Semitic, anti-Jew, and they don't even know why they're anti-Jew. One girl was holding up a sign that said from the river to the sea. And one of the reporters asked her what that meant. She said, I don't have any idea what it means. But she was there protesting. Uh, not knowing what that, how many of you know what from the river to the sea really means? That means wipe Israel off of the map and put them in the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's just really. And then secondly, there is a challenge of anti-Semiticism in the religion. Now, this one gets really, really tough. Today, it's called replacement theology, sometimes known as supersessionism, and covenant theology, or fulfillment theology. It essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. I grew up in a church that believed that the kingdom was now. And those holding this position believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people and God does not have a specific future for the nation of Israel. And, uh, and among the different views of their relationship 
between the church and Israel are the churches has replaced Israel. That's called replacement theology. Or the Abrahamic covenant and has been fulfilled thereby severing God's eternal relationship with the Jewish people and that Israel is no longer a witness of God to the nation no, and they are no longer necessary and that's called fulfillment theology. And it's, it's rising fast all over this country. All of it is mostly recognized as, and generally speaking, as what we refer to as Reformed Calvinism. Now, which we believe is not biblically sound. It goes back to the, the uh, world of Augustine of Hippo. And when you hear somebody quoting Augustine, you raise up a red flag quickly. Because Augustine may have been a Christian, I don't know. But he certainly did, did uh, do a lot of damage as far as we understand the literal interpretation of the Word of God. And he was a North African bishop in the 4th and 5th century, an author of the famous Confessions and called the City of God. And he believed that the thousand-year reign of Christ uh, on earth took on a broader view, believing it was an indefinite period between the first advent and the second advent of Jesus Christ, meaning that we are living in the kingdom at the present time. In his book on the city of God, he believed that the, that the devil is prevented right now from the exercise of the, his whole power to, uh, to seduce man, and that the saints can reign with Christ over the spirit of reigning with Christ over a spiritual kingdom. He believed that when Christ comes back, he will judge the living and dead, and this will be the uh, usher in the eternal state. And this is a world of such modern pastors and theologians as uh, Alistair Bagg, I think that's the way you pronounce his name, and David Platt, R.C. Sproul, Al Mohler Jr., and several other men that I will not mention their names. There is what is called the new formed uh, reformed Calvinism, unlike old reformed Calvinism. It's very ecumenical and very sympathetic uh, toward Rome and the tremendous influence of the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA, of which uh, Covenant College up on Lookout Mountain is associated with and, uh, and uh, is, has been a strong influence of reformed Calvinism since his move there in, uh, from Missouri um, uh, in the early 1970s. The PCA is formed in December 1973 with 260 congregations and today there are 1,700 churches in the United States who are considered themselves to be associated with the PCA. But also in Baptist churches, you see a sign that says Reformed Baptist Church, you know that they are associated with this group too. Like for instance, if you go up on Lookout Mountain, on the Tennessee side, and you go to look, the town of Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, right across the street from the post office will be the, the way what? Lookout Mountain Reformed Baptist Church. They are Calvinistic, and uh, they're fatalistic as can be. So following the October 7th, 2023 uh, uh, massacre, the next day a group called Churches for Middle East Peace whose members include the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the Reformed Church in America, the American Baptist Church in America, the Episcopalian Churches in America, the United Methodist Church in America, the Presbyterian Churches in America, called for an immediate ceasefire and condemned Israel for ethnic cleansing even before Israel responded. And this happened before Israel even had an attack to respond uh, uh, what, or even they never, never said a word. And they already sent letters the next day condemning Israel. And then, fourthly, this chapter helps us to look beyond ourselves to God's great purpose for history, which should lead us to more committed Christian life. 
Paul ends the chapter with an outburst of praise to the Lord for what he had done and what he is doing in our world today. Now, let's go to chapter 11. And we'll spend about 8 or 10 minutes here. And I hope this is a blessing to you because I, 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 made, I, I, I felt like that we needed to know about these things too because you have to be careful of who you listen to on the radio or you'll find out you may be extremely, uh, I mean, e easily pulled into it. For instance, when I was a, t a young uh, a Bible school student, I would drive home from sometimes on the weekend from, uh, from visiting my family and um, I would be turned on the radio and I would listen to the world tomorrow. And that man had a voice that would just draw you. His name was Herbert W. Armstrong. And boy, I'm telling you, he was so off base, it was unreal. But it was interesting to listen to it. I mean, how many of you listen, have ever heard Herbert W. Armstrong? You've heard it? He is, uh, his, his, his voice is just very drawing voice. It's unreal. And so you have to be very careful. Uh, you have to examine it in the light of what you believe about the Bible. And you know, maybe you don't believe a whole lot about the Bible. But brother, you, you ought to get in it. And it's time for every Christian to get in the book and begin to study it themselves and not just what, listen to somebody else and find out what somebody else is saying. Now I want you to look at our outline in our chapter, in, our, in Romans chapter 11. First of all, notice the fairness of God in dealing with Israel. In verses 1 to 10, the Apostle Paul starts dealing with a matter of just exactly what, what, the Jewish, what, he, what God is doing with the Jewish people. Why has Israel survived? Why have they survived? Because God said it would. It proves the reliability of the scripture and the, real, uh, the reality of God himself. And I read back in, Jack, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 31 where it was really true that God is not going to, uh, to, uh, to do away with Israel. So every time you turn your television on and every time you look at any, another account about Israel, you can marvel at the promises of God. And uh, that doesn't mean that everything Israel does is right. And later on I'll be telling you maybe, maybe in the next certain message about what was going on the night of the massacre. And Israel has its problems too. Israel at the present has been set aside under the discipline of the Lord throughout this age and the future coming tribulation. But until the universe is mapped and the center of the earth is explored, Israel will survive as a nation. We studied in the book of Revelation, when we studied the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, we found out that at the close of the tribulation that many of, God's, many of the Israelites will begin to recognize and put things together. And they'll see things that happen. In fact, over in Daniel chapter 12, uh, the prophet Daniel is talking about them uh, putting together, and it's, he said it's, it's almost like putting together a puzzle. And that these people are studying the minor prophets over there. Right now in Israel, they not only are studying the Torah, but they're studying the minor prophets. And the minor prophets, every one of the major and minor prophets, you can read them. Every one of them show a future for the nation of Israel. And then finally, the Bible says they're going to put the, all the last piece in the puzzle and step back and look at the whole picture, and they say, we have crucified the Messiah. And the Bible says that in Romans chapter 11, and all Israel shall be saved. It didn't mean that the whole, whole nation be saved. It meant that the nation will turn back and recognize the Messiah as the Lord Jesus and the, them, they will uh, accept him in, in their own hearts. So, something has happened. It seems like that Israel has gone too far. Surely now God is going to wipe them off the map because 
you, oh, you, you really need to study about the way they, their lifestyle. It's unreal. And that seems to have been the way Paul was leaning when uh, he said in verse 21, But to Israel he saith, All day long have I stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And he said, I ought to wipe you off of the map. But I made a promise. And you know what? I think about that. I like to apply it to my life. I don't live a perfect life. And it like the Lord to look down and say, I'm tired of putting up with you. I'll just wipe you off. But you know what? The Holy Spirit says you take that sin and you put it under the blood of Christ. And I do that and there's peace. He sure puts up with a lot of us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. My wife says this often when we get talking. She says, <coughs> it's a wonder God doesn't just wipe all of us off the map. <laughs> you know why he doesn't? He made a promise. And God keeps his promise. Amen. You hear me now. God always keeps his promises. And you say, well, what kind of promises he gave? Well, one, number one promise is this. <coughs> He promised me that if I would repent of my sin and turn to, turn to him, that he would give me eternal life. Do you know what that is, folks? How can you define the word eternal? The best definition is my definition, without cessation. He gave me life without cessation. Forever and ever and ever and ever. If I did what he asked me to do, that's a promise. That's his promise. He keeps his promises. Amen. Secondly, he not only gave promise to give me eternal life, but he promised me that if I would yield to him and give my life to him, that he would use me to be a blessing to the whole world. I told my class back there, you can't believe what my life was before I was saved. Could anybody in this room believe that I was an absolute introvert? Did you know when I got into the fifth grade, we had 12 in my class. Miss Maudie Lewis was our teacher. She said, the first day of school, I want each one of you to stand and give your name. I said, oh my. You mean I'm going to have to stand and say something before 12 people? I was just shaking like everything. And they said, all right, name them. And this girl said, my name is Dorothy Sistrunk. Boy said, my name is Tommy Riles. Another boy said, my name is Johnny Jones. Another girl said, I'm, my name is Ruth Barrett. Another girl said, my name is Helen Procell. And then there's another boy said, George Case. It was my time. I knew my name was Jimmy Dan Lilly. <laughs> I knew that. I stood up and I looked around and I was so shaky. I couldn't say my name and I had to sit up and sit down. Back down in embarrassment and Miss. Miss Maudy had to tell the class my name. Everybody knew me anyway. But you know what? God saved me. And he turned things around. You see my report card in my high school years, you'd think this guy needs to be behind a plow plowing a mule. My principal called me in and he said, Jim, if you're going to college, you're going to have to really, really change some things. Boy, your grades are so bad, it's unreal. I did go to college. And his first year in 1957, the first year, they had a college entrance exam. I failed the college entrance exam, and they put me in bonehead English. You all know what bonehead English? Anybody here? Anybody know it? 
Oh, come on, you're going to live back that That's That starts you out at number one. <laughs> you know what my grade was at the end of the semester? F. And I got a letter from the school and saying, because of your grades, you cannot attend this school, college anymore. 18 years old, 19. Can you believe that? Oh, but you know, one day came into my life, it came a point in my life where it said, Lord, I don't have much to give you, but whatever, I, whatever you have, what do you want, whatever, you, whatever I got, it's yours. And that promise was fulfilled. And I've been pastor of churches for 62 years now. I am a testimony that God will keep his promise. Amen. Now, God made another promise. He promised me that he would bless my life if I would give to him. Give the sources that I give. That is 10%. So my wife and I started doing that in 1962. We didn't start. She was already tithing, and I was too. We just put, the, put all of it in the same pot. The Bible also said if you give money by promise, that God will bless that. 1972... My wife and I made promises to God we would give more money to missions every week and he would bless us and we would never be where we couldn't. And since that time, we have not missed one week in giving to missions above our tithes. Yeah, he's taken care of. That's promises. Just like he said to promise to Abraham, you will have a land forever, you'll have a, you'll have a people forever, and you will be a blessing forever. So folks, listen. Claim his promises and walk by faith and trust him, and he'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Amen. You got it? Claim it and walk with the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. You're here today. And you, by your testimony, if you were asked to stand and give a testimony, you could say, I know that I am saved because. You answer them. <coughs> if you could say, I am saved because I know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I've had an experience of salvation when I got born again. And I thank God for salvation. Would you raise your hand right now? Hold it high in the air. And would you thank the Lord for his wonderful salvation? Would you do that right now? All across the audience. You're here tonight, Tate. Thank you. You may put your hands down. God bless you all. You're here today and you say, Preacher, there's no way I'd raise my hand toward heaven and say that I was saved when I didn't know for sure that I, if I died, I'd go to heaven. But Preacher, if you could know for sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven, I'd like to know for sure. And would you pray for me? Would you be honest enough to just slip your hand up in the air and put it right back down and I'll remember you in prayer? Anybody in this audience? God bless you. Maybe here tonight, today, and you'd say, Preacher, I raise my hand that I'm saved, that I'm born again. I, I face problems every day in my life. And I've been trying to work things out on my own. And I have never really completely myself and yielded myself to Christ and said, 
Lord, here, you got it all. You belong, I belong to you. Whether you're a layman or, what, or a lady, whatever. You said, never said, Lord, take over everything I own. I give it to you. And you'd say, preacher, pray for me. I've got some, I've, I'm dealing with some situations right now in my life. I trust you'll remember me in prayer. Would you slip your hand up right now? Hold it there for a moment. God bless you, and 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 God bless you. Anybody else? Slip it up, hold it there for a moment, put it right back down. God bless all of you. Father, thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Father, that we can depend on you. And Lord, we've proven you over and over and over again. And yet, Father, we still struggle at times, and I do. And I, I, I just ask you to cleanse my heart of it and help me to, uh, to trust you always in everything, Father. Bless these who have raised their hand. Most of the audience raised their hand. Some were not sure they were saved, and others raised their hand and indicated to me that they struggle in their Christian life, and there are things that just not, they just really don't, really commit to the Lord. I pray that today they'll do what God wants them to do. Have your way, Father, we pray, in the invitation for Christ's sake. Amen. Look this way, if you will. Brother Malcolm, what number, please, sir? 292. 292. Turn there, if you will. And if you're here today and you're not sure about salvation, oh, we'd like to help you. We would. We'd like to help you. We'd like to take you aside and uh, talk to you. And if you're a lady, if you just make your way down the middle aisle, the side aisles, and you go right to your right into the inquiry room, there'll be someone go with you and take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can be saved and know for sure that if you died, you go to heaven. There may be some people that just need to come to the altar and make the front pews here an altar and say, Lord, I struggle, and I believe my struggle is because I haven't given everything to you. And right now, I give everything to you, and I rest in all your promises, and I claim every one of your promises in your word. Help me to be dedicated to you. You do what God wants you to do as we stand together. Brother Malcolm, lead us, please, sir.